you are undoubtedly aware, dear reader, that Christopher Columbus is a permanent resident of the bad place, as is right and proper. And you certainly recall that when you were introduced to him back in elementary school, the very first thing you learned was that he, a professional explorer, got into some vicious intellectual brawls with a map, and the map won. But you might not know how he managed to veer so dramatically off course, how many scholars in multiple countries warned him in advance that his math was terrible, and the extent to which the Spanish crown self-grifted in order to keep him happy. A smidge under 1700 years ago, Constantine the Great looks around, sighs, and says, you know, Rome is great. But the East seems so much more strategically important these days. Also, I deserve a vacation home. Everyone shooketh. How could any place be more awesome than Rome? But Constantine proves pretty annoying about it. So he packs up all Rome's knickknacks and tigers and moves the capital to Byzantium. He renames the city after himself and even has special collector's edition coins printed to mark the occasion. The Roman Empire falls a bit later on, but only the western half. The East Eastern half, renamed the Byzantine Empire, is fine for a few centuries. Then the Seljuk Turks come calling and Byzantine shrinks smaller and smaller. Desperate, they shoot the Pope a DM and they're like, Dad, the Turks keep picking on me and my army's like the size of a Lunchable now. Wanna join a war? We'd help you take the Holy Land back. The Pope is into it and launches a value pack of crusades, all of which he loses. But some Italian city-states scored gnarly trade routes in the process and one of those was Genoa, Columbus's hometown. For about 1,500 years, most of the trading between the East and West occurred via the Silk Road, with the Byzantine Empire, Venice, and Genoa acting as middlemen. But in 1453, the Ottoman Turks completely destroyed the last remaining speck of the Byzantine Empire and captured Constantinople. Their first order of business was to create a tax on Western countries so severe that they knew no one would actually be able to pay it. And Europe finally thought, uh, maybe it's bad actually that there's only one way to reach India, and that a fair amount of our economy's performance relies on a single group of people being nice to us. There's got to be something else we can do. Most of the big wigs agreed that the solution was to steer around Africa. Now, I'm almost positive that I remember in elementary school, we were taught that Columbus, along with most of his contemporaries, believed that the Earth was flat. And that's not even remotely accurate. Almost all educated folk in his day knew that the Earth was round. Columbus, always eager to impress, told his cat and a bakery loaf and probably his brother and every random person who had the misfortune of crossing the street that he was using that he had solved everything. Since the world was round, a ship departing from the West would eventually land in the east if it proved persistent enough. Although that wouldn't be a voyage one could complete in an afternoon, it would surely be much quicker than trying to maneuver around a massive continent. Columbus, cats and kittens, loved to read, but he was the kind of guy who voraciously skims books, doesn't fully comprehend the information, and then arranges them on a coffee table in such a way that visitors will definitely notice the titles. There was a famous 9th century astronomer known as Alfraganus. He was a scientific instrument stand, but he's best remembered for writing a book report on Ptolemy, which he used as a device to update everyone on the space facts old Tolls got wrong, which included an estimate on Earth's circumference. A few hundred years later, Columbus was stomping around his local Barnes & Noble. He spotted Alfraganus' book and realized it was the perfect conversation piece for his upcoming Christmas Party. Then he accidentally read it, discovered the Earth Math section, and excitedly skipped into the den in search of a post it note. Here's the first problem the world didn't have an international standard for what constitutes a mile until 1959. Alfraganus was a Persian astronomer writing 600 years before Columbus, and he expressed his calculations in Arabic miles. Arabic miles and Roman miles were very different. Since Alfraganus wrote his book to update Ptolemy's where Columbus read that as well and decided immediately that he knew better and redid some of the calculations himself, causing Tolles' already inaccurate data to become even more distorted. Then he read several other works, 
Sometimes he scribbled down inaccurate conclusions, other times he simply misunderstood what he was reading, and occasionally it was both. After racing through all those heavy plather volumes, Columbus set up one of those giant pin boards featured in shows with surly but dedicated detectives and examined everything he'd learned. Were Columbus living today, he'd unquestionably be a guy who tweets, do your own research at experts. Now you might be wondering, didn't he consult a scholar before he set sail, even like one person? Because surely if there was an actual mathematician fact-checking his numbers, they'd have realized right away that his calculations were thousands of miles off. And in fact, that's exactly what happened when he barged into Portugal and attempted to sell them a voyage. Yo, math nerds of the court, pick up, it's your boss, the big cheese. Your integers and pathor area, I don't know, quotients or whatever are gravely needed. I don't know the terms, that's why I have y'all. We're here, sup? Some swarmy Genoan is hollering in the lobby, claims he's discovered a plan to finally snatch some of that sweet, sweet Indian spice we've all been craving. Constantinople's still closed? It's been like 30 years now, what the heck is taking so long? That's nobody's business but the Turks. Let's take a look at his plan. Yeah, this guy has no idea what he's doing. Get out. Who was that at the door? Some internet commenter trying to sell us a voyage claims he can finally snatch some of that sweet, sweet Indian spice we've all been craving. Sounds expensive. We're fighting a war, you know. It's the late 1400s. Everyone's fighting a war. What did you tell him? I emailed his plans to our royal math nerds. This dude has no idea what he's doing. You should definitely pass. He will screw this up. You're probably right. I do want those spices, though. And what if, despite the fact that our council of smart people just declared that he's wrong, he's not wrong? Then we'd end up with no spices. Or worse yet, if we turn him down, he might pitch this idea that the smart people said we definitely shouldn't greenlight to another country, they would get our spices. What should we do? We shouldn't hire him, but we also shouldn't not hire him. Let's pay him a retainer and make clear that we don't actually want him to do anything until we reach a decision. How much money are we talking about here? Maybe what an average sailor would make in a full year? To literally sit there and do nothing. Look, do you want to be wrong? Because being wrong all the time is his deal. I'm not sure that's the argument you think is. Think of the spices, Ferdy. What's up, my boys? Me again. So I couldn't help but notice that there's still an embarrassing lack of spices here in Portugal, and it's too bad you don't know any kick-ass, handsome, genius, brave explorers offering a shortcut. I mean, imagine if a person like that existed and was standing right here in front of you. Imagine if you gazed at that miraculous Renaissance genius and passed on the opportunity. Oh, how history would judge. I've hired my fair share of explorers, you know. Actually, it's the focus of my entire government. Soon, under my rule, Portugal's crushing debt will be completely wiped and our currency will be the strongest in all of Europe. And that's because of the money and focus that I pour into explorations, and I'm not a fan of the vibe that you're throwing off. I do want those spices, though. And our explorers have not successfully steered around Africa yet, so let me think about it. Hey, I'm back. I successfully steered around Africa. Chris, get out. Ah, oh, dang it. That explorer selling voyages door to door is back. Oh, right. I'd forgotten about that guy. You know, I hope we didn't offend him by offering such a small check last time. Have him wait outside and we'll write him another check. I've been mulling this whole thing over and I'm not sure that... No, you're right. We should also write him a letter that he can show to anyone in our lands, ordering them to serve him free food and lodging on the house whenever he wants. He'll score unlimited free meals and hotel rooms and we'll pay for that? Of course not. Weren't you listening? No money will change hands. We'll just force our subjects to give him stuff. Okay, again, I believe reevaluating this entire arrangement would spices. Hey, hey, it's my favorite couple. Sorry, I'm late. Bit of a family emergency to sort out. You guys know I love you, right? Because I do. My love for you is deep and profound. 
I realize that I've been cashing your checks and enjoying all the free accommodations that you're forcing your subjects to provide for me, but if I'm being completely honest, you're taking an unreasonably long time reaching the correct decision here. I shipped my bro up to England in case Henry VII was interested in hiring me first. Turns out he didn't actually make it though, got captured by pirates. Wait, everything we've done for you and you've been shopping around? We paid you so that you wouldn't do that. I thought you'd been paying me because I look fly and I'm a pleasure to have in class. So are we good? Are we doing this? Maybe. It's such an important decision though and we're still on the fence. How about we pay you twice as much as before plus throw in a stipend for new fancy clothes? You know, maybe this isn't if he believes the cash was because he looks fabulous but he's also talking to Henry then we're obviously not making him feel fabulous enough. New threads would inspire everyone in this situation, don't you think? We're burning through our allowance here. I know. I'm worried about that too. Those spices though. Damn, I do love those spices. Hola, Iberia Ritos. That's how you say it, right? Anyway, thanks for agreeing to move the date. Cheapers. What a month over at mi casa, you know? Eh? Eh? My brother finally showed up in England, but those pirates had been holding him prisoner forever. Henry was so disgusted, I'm pretty sure he didn't even consider our proposal. You know, it's still kind of messed up that you pitched them while we were paying you to not pitch anyone else, right? Oh, don't worry, amigos. That was inconsiderate of me, and I've learned my lesson. Please stop speaking Spanish. Good. Now. The English are Philistines, so they're off my list. I made Bart take a shower and sent him to France last month. Can you believe Charles VIII's math nerds called me a muffin head? Like it's my fault they don't understand numbers. This elaborate years long prank is losing what remains of its charm at an alarming rate. Hello? Oh, Hearn, come in. Uh, Chris, I know that we already had our math nerds determine that you're wrong, and Portugal agreed, and also England, and now France, apparently. But since four councils of smart people from four different countries wasn't quite sufficient, I've asked Hearn to add his two reels. And you, Clarigo de Talvera, inevitably concluded that I am a world-class mind, that my gifts shall be unrivaled for centuries to come. Uh, no. Actually, I found that you have no idea what you're talking about. That's it. I'm out. Sorry, I wasn't listening. Where did the queen go? To her room, annoyed. I'll talk to her. My queen, your husband asks if you would reconsider, and I think that's a good idea. A couple years from now, I'll become a rock star of the Spanish Inquisition, so what I consider good should probably be weighed carefully, but what can you do? I also think it is a good idea. Not really, though. I'd prefer to not be here. Hearn? Why are you here? Didn't you literally just tell me that this man is a total muffin head? The finest bakers in the land could not craft a foodstuff more muffiny, your majesty. But your husband asked me to come along and convince you to hire the guy anyway, and he is the king. It's not like I can say no. Well, I'm saying no. Hey, sorry to interrupt. The king sent me to- You too? Dude is that allergic to just coming up here and talking to me himself. What the flippin' heck? You ought to hire the muffin head. If you don't, he'll take his ideas elsewhere. He already peddled his terrible ideas to half of Europe! What if this idiot actually does pull it off, though? Think of the fame, the glory. No one will even remember him, probably. All of Europe will be like, man, did you see what Spain did? God, they're so cool. I wish we could be like them. I do want those spices, but even if I believed he had any chance of success, I doubt we can actually afford it. I mean, we probably could have if we hadn't paid him so much money to not hire him, but that doesn't help us now. I'd have to sell the crown jewels, and they're very nice. I'd like to keep them. What if I pay for most of the voyage with the crown kicking in the difference? Oh, I didn't realize you were that wealthy. I'm not. I'll need to borrow most of the money. Yeah, okay. Tell my husband I'm in. Let's hire this cheese bag and hope for the best. Hey there, Spanish royals. I'm Chris's brother. I think he mentioned me once. I'm the guy who was captured by pirates, and then I just spent an eternity in France doing French stuff. I dropped by Chris's apartment a few times, but he never seems to be home. I heard you finally hired him, so before he leaves, I thought I'd... He already went there, came back, and left again. Wow, okay, so he did find an alternate route to India. I knew it. What a genius. Get out. 